Hey, it's crumbs. You're lost? How do you not know where you are? It's Thorin's channel. This is episode six of Watch the Overture. Back with Yiska, and we've got a guest again, just like we did for the Sideshow episode. It's going to be Elbian. You might know him from his time writing on .esports, if you were one of those 40 people who read any of those articles. <laughs> Listen, I'll, we laugh because if we didn't, we'd have to cry. That's it's true. So, Elbian, you've also been involved in Overwatch with some teams through the contenders scene, the uh, the semi-pro, the amateur scene, whatever people want to describe it as. I know they try to now describe it as like the amateur scene, but I've always thought like semi-pro is the best term, you know, right? So obviously this is an area which despite we're told all the time that the Overwatch League has succeeded and it's got these huge numbers and look at these millions of dollars. But my question would is always going to be, you've got to have more than like half a dozen teams in the actual world playing the game. So I always wonder, you know, what's the health of an ecosystem of a game? How does talent make its way up through the ranks? Because, you know, not everyone's going to be scouted out of nowhere like fucking Jonah can come straight into the league and be amazing. So I think a lot of people are interested to know what's going on in the content. Scene. Not interested enough to actually tune in and watch the broadcast, I noticed, but they, you know, in theory, they want to know what's going on. How do people get along in this sense? And it's an area somewhat shrouded in mystery. Like I think a lot of people have the sentiment that maybe Blizzard doesn't do enough with that or they don't put enough shine on it or conspiracy theories you might get into late in the episode. So let's start here, Albion. Give us a basic rundown. For people who only know that there's the Overwatch League and then there's contenders, and a lot of them might only know about the contenders teams that are contenders teams of the Overwatch League teams, even though there are some others. How would you describe the Overwatch League contenders scene? Like, is it actually, is it vibrant? Is it is there a lot going on in it? Um, the, the part that's like really difficult for me because I've worked with a lot of them is the players take it as seriously as anybody else, you know, playing any other game in the world. Okay. Um, the, and I know because I've had this conversation with many coaches and players that the actual name that they give to like the Twitter handle for the contender, where it's like the path to pro and they mark it as like, these guys are trying to become professional players. Um, it really, you know, annoys a lot of people because these are guys who are putting in, you know, 40, 50 hour weeks, scrimming every day, you know, watching VODs back, you know, they, they, you know, putting their heart into it and they're just told that they're on the path to pro, right? And a lot of these people also played pro before the Overwatch League. You know, a lot of these yes. people have really storied histories and they just didn't make it in for a wide array of reasons. Um, and I would say that the general consensus that I've heard and my personal opinion as well is that no, Blizzard doesn't do enough for contenders. Yeah. Okay. Also, just just re uh, briefly, they also earning livable salaries. So they literally, in the literal form of professional, also professional because at, at least some of them are. Right? Yeah. Um. I know in North America, almost everybody is, and I can't comment too much on other regions actually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So one thing I know, this is something that people will be aware of, but can you actually explain, like, what is the what is the exact situation with people's contracts when they're a contenders player? Because people might remember the most famous example of this, obviously, was that Flower when he got put on the NYXL contenders team. Like, technically, other teams are allowed to, like, like match the offer or something like you can make an offer for a player, but then the original team has an option to match it or so. Isn't it something along these lines? Have, have I got the parameters roughly right? Yeah, ish. Um, so if you're on a, any contenders team, it doesn't have to be an academy team. Um, an Overwatch League team can come down to the org and say, hey, we want to buy this player. And if the player agrees to it, like the player gets a written form that's like signed. There's some specific they have to get. Um, they, they get the player um, and the org can't really do anything about it. And Blizzard has decided on the parameters for um, like the amount of buyout money that you have to do. Right. And and it's low. I don't remember the exact from off the top of my head, but it's based on the player's starting salary. Um, and a lot of the players who are coming out of contenders, you got to imagine they're probably not going to be getting, you know, the six figure contracts. They might be getting closer to the minimum of like 50K. Okay. So it puts it in a situation where if you're not an academy team, if you're trying to become like a farm org, right, that like develops players and sells them off to owl teams, it's almost impossible to make to make um, to make money on that. Okay, 
So what do you think, Yiska, of this? It's your scene. It's a game you follow very closely. You're even one of the perverts who actually does watch contenders sometimes. <laughs> so what do you actually think of the health of the scene or where, where it's at at the moment? Because as I say, for all, to be fair, I have a very open mind. Like a lot of the people who are critical, if like I don't know if they even watch contenders. So I feel like some people, it's just they don't, there's not enough... Uh, exposure to it perhaps that they think is why they've got this sentiment that it's like neglected so so what's your take on it so generally i would say that each contenders region pretty much produces teams that well at the very least are better than shanghai dragons but probably are lower mid-tier level uh overwatch league teams or would be and then obviously they would have more potential given that they would then if they were to be adopted into the overwatch league system they would be uh, having more staff and you know resources, maybe a team house and whatever, and they would then possibly develop further there. So definitely, Contenders career stands out, I, I think, as as a talent development system. But also, you have to say uh, that one feels a bit unfair though, because to be fair, it is just Apex, but without the teams that join the Overwatch League. So I I don't even think that should count as Contenders. Like, come on, there's there's not there's not exactly that many full teams, is there? No, yeah, definitely, yeah, but. I mean, at the same time, NA Contenders now pretty much has adopted half of that the Apex players in a sense, because sure. there's a, a load of uh, Korean players on there too. Even our players or former our players now. So I think generally, so the thing is that always to me seems to be the limiting factor is that there seems to be a lack of resources, which generally makes it so that at least in the sort of weaker regions and also in Europe, often very simplistic strategies are played that because they're somehow easier to execute and they also played across a whole variety of maps, which you probably wouldn't necessarily see in uh, in the Overwatch League because the, the strategies usually are more nuanced and you probably also have a bigger roster and better one-on-one -on -one coaching for these bench players or whatever. Whatever the reason might be, but um, often the strategies seem more limited than in Overwatch League teams. But I would say, for instance, it, once again, I have to point out uh, Contenders Korea. I think the, the talent that's developed there is pretty much top notch and Korea keeps doing it despite the the PC bang rates dropping and like the their talent and development doesn't seem to be slowed down by that. Okay, right. Albion, what about this as a topic then? So we have heard, I mean, I mean, I guess this interview never came up, but we referenced it on oversight. So when the Dallas Fuel team was doing really badly, Taimu even said that basically they got to the point where no one would scrim them except Shanghai Dragons and then a bunch of the contenders teams. Like that's literally how bad their practice had gotten. So uh, do the how does it work in that sense? Is it just the top contenders sometimes get to scrim with our old teams? If you get to scrim with our teams, do you actually get to go like all the way up? Like if you're the contenders team of a top owl team, do you get to scrim? What's the sense in that regard? Um there was a little bit of like a merit system almost where, because I was with Envision last season and Envision was not affiliated with an OWL org. Um, obviously the roster is now part of Dallas Fuel, but we got not super frequently, but maybe once or twice a week, we would get um, warm-up scrims. We would play like the warm-up match for OWL teams, right, before they went on stage. Um, so we got to play with like notably like the Gladiators a few times. Um, and in that instance specifically, I, I, I know that the Gladiators Academy team apparently was never their warm-up block. They instead went to other people, right? Okay. But on the flip side, I know other teams like um, XL2, who's NYXL's Academy team, got a lot of support from, um, from, the, from the OWL org. They, they got to scrim them, you know. Um, my understanding was that they actually uh, were given um, the overhead VODs that... Um, you know, like no, none of the other contenders teams have access to, right? Like on Envision, we had to, you know, record our own stuff. And for tournament VODs, all we had was either what players could record, which players don't like doing because it affects their FPS, or um, or like the tournament VOD, right? That uh, I would record the tournament VOD, like the, just the Twitch stream with the my players' comms over it, and then just sync it up, right, in, in Premiere. And that's how we'd have tournament VODs, right? Um, and like some of the uh, academy teams got like a lot more support in some other ways because they got access to like owl resources that other you know non academy teams just don't have. 
What about this then? So, Yiska, believe it or not, we've actually already found a small ray of sunshine because that actually the scenario where contenders teams really do scrim with overwatch league teams is already better than the majority of other leagues around the world in other games like in league of legends it's very rare that like challenger teams are going to be scrimming the lcs teams because the lcs teams are going to have blocks with the other lcs teams you know i don't know that there's actually a massive amount of chance because people will just look down on the challenger teams and think what's well, the point you know they're not as good as us what, what would you say about that because in theory that should help with development right if you get to play against the real team i actually i will say though that j you get to scrim the owl teams but because contenders and owl are not necessarily in the same patch you're playing on a different patch and the map pools are different. So you're playing a different map pool. So, and it's, it's very much a situation where the owl team comes in being like, we're doing you a favor. You're going to, you know, meet all of our demands or we're not okay. screwing you. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you get to play them and yes, you get to play against, you know, that, that kind of caliber of players, but you have to do it in circumstances that necessarily aren't good for your own practice. You're, you're setting them up to have good practice. In a sense, I think what is, really weird to me is the way I heard it is that the the contenders and the Overwatch League teams, even on the academy teams, don't really work together. And, you know, the Gladiator stuff definitely is also part of it. But I've, I've heard stuff like teams literally scrimming the contenders team before they play the main team. And that just that just blows my mind. And then asking them questions to please defend this very specific strategy against us also please don't leak this like i i've no like yes this it's pretty good for uh contenders teams that they get that practice then again i have to question how you know two-sided this really is and how, how synergetic i'm not sure that the the owl level of play especially individually is that far above that being then the you know the type of team that has to you know, pretty much do what the owl team tells you to do is really helping your game as much as it should sound like i guess okay what would you say to that albion because every every time i've ever talked to anyone on oversight they're actually usually pretty dismissive of contenders and they're like oh the team's down there the level's a lot lower they're not as good how, how far do you think the gap is um I can't calm because I don't know. I didn't get to watch like scrims in other regions like every day constantly. But I know in NA, at least last season, I would say that like the top four, maybe the top five in NA could have been like somewhere in the like, mm, maybe like seventh to 10th in Owl, I think. Like just, and it was, it was hard. It's kind of hard to make the comparison because it was different map pool, different patches and everything. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of, um, like, because obviously I didn't hear the other team's comms, you know, I would just watch them play. And I, so I get a very similar kind of impression from it. And just the way that like teams seem to have formulated their ideas and like, you know, work towards a goal, like a consistent goal. Like every team had their own kind of approach to everything. Um, so like in NA, there was uh, this really predominant style that evolved along um, um, among a lot of the top teams where like the Winston Tracer kind of like, ignored a lot of the game and just like hid together and then they would jump out and execute players together and that was like really common across teams like fusion university did it optic did it you know all these teams did it and but every team took it like in their own approach and it kind of it, it kind of made it that you could tell that these teams are still putting in the same amount of thought to it right and you know the players are still hitting the shots and they're still killing people so at no point did I really think like, oh, we are like so much massively worse than the Overwatch League teams. To be fair, you know, these people are, you know, players who this is their life to them, right? And their entire purpose in playing in contenders is they want to be an owl. So this is something that they take very seriously. And I took it very seriously. And, you know, all the coaching staff did. So we also probably didn't want to tell ourselves that we were that much worse. Okay. Yeah, it's also that probably contenders teams get to the new patch like often my idea is that overwatch league teams come to contenders teams that have already played on that patch in preparation for a new one and that might feel pretty good for the contenders teams then because they're obviously much more knowledgeable about the the patch that they're playing and might even win some scrims that way i, I would have mentioned right yeah um, to a certain extent, I obviously I wasn't with an academy team, so I don't I don't actually know if they like directly came and asked 
them. Um, but because the patch difference was actually something really weird, where for most of the season of Overwatch League, I, I know you guys did a whole thing on this, but I didn't watch a lot of the Overwatch League matches because they mm. didn't matter or I didn't think they were going to be interesting. Okay. But it was a different patch, right? And I'm like, it's yeah. just, and it's most of the time it was an older patch where there have been, you know, yeah. changes that are now in affecting contenders. So it, it was almost like I would only be watching it for entertainment, not for like useful data. And I, like, you know, you kind of have to make that time judgment, right? Like, where is my time best put? And <laughs> I think if the um, Owl teams were to come down to the Contenders teams, like by the time they got onto the same patch, I don't know how useful that information would even be. Because by the time they come down, like s these little micro metas, right, where we know like the, the different tendencies of each team have evolved to the point where we're on that patch, but like we're not resembling how other teams in that Overwatch League would play that patch. Yeah. Just because the players are different. Isn't it, like this is one of the reasons I notice everyone, as you referenced, gets triggered by the whole path to parole thing because first of all, like it, it's just kind of a disingenuous message to send to the general public, that, you know that because obviously the the most egregious element of it is they try to imply some mad leap that if you get high in just playing matchmaking solo queue, that then you will then go from there along the path to the Contenders Academy team, then to Overwatch League. Like, first of all, we've only just had Overwatch League, so there was no path. What are you talking about? Like, yeah. secondly, that is far from an established like path. It's just that that's obviously I understand why they do it. It's marketing for the casual player to tell him that like you know you can sort of drift into the pro scene okay there's something to that it's just it's it's not nearly as established as they imply i know literally one story of of a player doing that and it was on envision it was um the the flex uh, support mm. pool was kind of limited in the like in the later um, signing period before the season of contenders and um our our number one and number two flex players ended up going to other teams for various reasons so we were like a week and a half out from the signing deadline and we're just like who the who the hell are we supposed to go for right because there was no players who had team experience that was worth anything because they're on teams you know they're, they've never really competed in anything and like we on envision very literally opened up the game client went to the top 500 leaderboard and just asked the the highest ranked zenyatta player to come trial and that was crimzo <laughs> And he ended up coming to the team and he ended up being one of the best players on that team. He was like a super positive mindset and everything. And I mean, now he's on an academy team, right? It remains to be seen if he makes the jump to Owl, but like that's literally the one story I know of that. The the whole like, you're just going to play ladder and, you know, somehow it's going to turn into a pro career. It's just not real. It also, yeah. by the way, inadvertently just helps like this is just a sidebar, stupid narratives like implying that it's sexism keeping women out of the scene, you know, because obviously like some of them are probably like, I'm pretty good when I play in matchmaking. It's like, that's irrelevant. Like you have to actually try yeah. and join a team, meet well, an amateur team. If matchmaking was like worth a the shit, then people would care about it more too. But like there's so many problems. I mean, you know, I won't rehash any of them because I'm sure you guys have seen it on Twitter and whatever. Pro players complain about it constantly. Like ladder is not a you know, conducive environment to playing competitively. And I don't, I can't think of a game ever that I, at least I know of where ladder really was like a, you know, real competitive environment that in any yeah. way mimics what being on a team is like, you know, um, it, it's just, they're two completely different games. So as much as like, you know, all-star performance on ladder is, is good and all because it shows your mechanical skill in no way does it show that you're ready to be on a team. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the topic is for both of you or that contenders is on a different patch and has a different timeline as a result? Because again, if these are players who are going to potentially get into Overwatch League, sometimes even during the season, it seems like uh, kind of, it's hard to see an upside. The, um, the, the only upside, ups sorry, keep oh. going. Okay. I was going to say the only upside, at least this year was the first season of contenders because obviously the second one's going now and there's gonna be a third one later this year is that the first season of contenders was a patch ahead of overwatch league so if you looked amazing on that patch during the mid-season signings when that when that season of contenders was being played you might get picked up okay. to play like it was like stage three and owl um because what was it, it was like um ksf went to the valiant um, and we all initially thought that KSF was brought onto the Valiant because we knew he was playing Sombra in contenders and we knew that he was a pretty decent Sombra. So we thought, well, maybe the Valiant's like, shit, we need a Sombra player for this patch. And then they never played him. So who knows?
But when you're a team, for example, who's in contenders and you scrim against an owl team, presumably they're scrimming on your patch, right? Because you'd have to play on like the tournament realm or something to be on their patch. Is that correct? Um, when we've scrimmed owl teams, uh, we had to scrim them on live. Right. So because there are there's there's three or there, I guess four technically different like overwatch servers right the one that everyone knows is live that you know everyone at home plays the game on one is the ptr the public test realm where you can go try out like the upcoming stuff the third is a LAN client which is only at lands so the overwatch league has that client and like when we went to poland to play in the um semifinals and like finals we had access to the LAN client then and the LAN client is the one with like the ability to do the overhead bots and stuff right where like you see the the little icons of the hero and you can okay. zoom out infinitely to like see the whole map and then there's the um opr which i actually forget what it stands for but that's like the online tournament realm and the opr what, what blizzard does is they open it to like one patch at a time and because Owl will never play on the OPR, they'll play on LAN, it was only ever the um, Contenders patch that was available on the OPR. Um, so when we had to scrim Owl teams, right, we would have to go play on live because most of the time Owl was playing on whatever was live at the time. So and it, it puts it in a situation where, you know, when you do get to scrim an Owl team as well, you're also playing a higher ping because you're on like a different server and, you know, all this stuff. Okay. What do you think of that, Yiska? I think the most ridiculous part about this is, is like, you would think that this would add or help contenders' viewership because the viewer that wants to see competition on the patch that is live is going to get it in contenders, right? Because they are playing on a more, uh, you know, modern patch, more up to date patch. Actually, was the case that often was it? Like, even contenders was playing on outdated patch, patches quite quite frequently. And the so season's only like a month long, <laughs> and we're still on an outdated patch. Is it like th not even that boon you give to that uh, to that competition? Now, I definitely don't think that um, you should like immediately switch and be at the mercy of uh, live patches coming coming up, and you probably also won't you know clue contenders teams in when patches will deploy, because that will leak 100%. So it's it's hard to work around that problem, but at the same time, this also didn't pan out to be a huge advantage for uh, for contenders teams. Um, what I will say, though, is that usually the contenders patches then became the owl patches, right? Um, well, I mean, so far we've only had one season, right? So. Uh, the contenders last season um, was on the patch where Sombra got like a bunch of massive buffs. Her like translocators, uh, the time it sat on the ground was increased, and her um, her weapon spread was narrowed. So she mm. effectively did a lot more damage, and she could spend a lot more time harassing the enemy in the backline. So she just became this like mega powerful DPS. Mm. And in Korea, she like took over. In NA, she was kind of there. In like Europe, she wasn't as much there. Um, and that was the patch that Owl played in stage three. And when Contender started, I think okay. we were about like halfway through stage two or something. So we were, you know, a few weeks ahead of them. And mm -hmm. then this season of Contenders, um, the playoffs, I, I'm actually, I'm pretty sure the playoffs and Contenders are the same patch because now it's the patch with the new Hanzo with Storm Arrows instead of Scatter Arrow and like the rework Sonic Arrow and stuff. So generally speaking, it's ahead, but at least this season, it was basically dead on. Yeah, just a little tangent because I I know that this Sombra thing was also pretty much viable because she was able to hack around corners, right? Pretty much, wasn't it something um, like that way? Was they, very they delayed. cut the? Oh, that's right. They also cut the time on her hack. It went from point eight seconds to point six seconds, mm -hmm. which it didn't sound like a lot, but it was enough of a margin where because most of the time in in past it was the diva player who's responsible for interrupting hacks. Because mm. she has like a shotgun, right? And mm. like generally Sombra had to be kind of close. So it was really easy for her to like turn and flick and just shoot the Sombra real quick. And that small little window was enough time where, especially for contenders, which is all online, you can't react fast enough. Yes. So hacks were just getting off really crazy. And when they made the changes, the unintended side effect was that Sombra could kind of get hacks off if the character did go through a corner still. And they ended up fixing that. And for the contenders playoffs, um, because they changed the patch between... Um, between not even between playoffs, between the quarterfinals and semifinals, between the online section of the playoffs and the mm -hmm. land section, they put it to the new patch where Sombra's hack could no longer go through buildings and stuff. And it was like it was absurd the amount of stuff that stopped it. Like I remember um, 
on Junker Town in the second section, there's like a bunch of like wires that hang across the road, right? Yeah. And like if a diva flew up over the like wires and the summer tried to hack it, as she came down, the wire would stop the hack. So it and like that combined with like some other changes they did, like summer was basically out the window. So I know like in Vision in particular, we really suffered without yeah. without Sombra because we had we had spent a ton of time practicing Sombra and then, you know, I'm not saying that we would have won if Sombra was still there, but you know, we would have probably would have done better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, what about this then? If the level isn't, like, drastically different, if all these teams and contenders aren't just, like, crap, because I know a sentiment that some, some of them people are. have is that some people worry that part of the problem is that maybe they're not real teams, like they're teams of just patchwork. You know, you get this player, this player, you don't know if someone's going to get taken from you, you don't know if someone's going to be on the same contenders. Some people worry that it's it, that because it's not literally, like, Division 2 and it's a real league in its own right and has... Like that, I suspect that's one of the reasons people don't watch as much because they don't think it, they don't really feel as though. Like, here's the difference in the League of Legends world, in the past, in theory, the team that was the best in Challenger could get promoted and might be in LCS. Mm-hmm. So, in a way, you could watch in that sense, you know, like I like this player, I want to follow his career, could become an LCS team next. Is that an issue, do you think? Why do you think contenders kind of just get so put to one side? Because the best chance you have of, Something like that. I remember in League of Legends, there was the promotion system for a while before they franchised out of out of the challenger scene. And the best you have, and I mean, I, I will say this like very literally, the motivational like speech I gave to my team in the hotel room was like, all right, guys, we got to get here. We got to look good. So that way, if the Overwatch League expands, we look good and like somebody sure. considers picking us up. Like, but that sure. is your best chance. It is not guaranteed in any way, right? And, you know, they could also then come down and say, we're going to take these two players and then move on to the next team. We're going to take these two players, you know? So it, it is hard to, like, I don't know, like, build, like, a family in your team, right? Um, because all these people really do want to be in the Overwatch League. So uh, I know that there's a lot of teams that, like, they feel if people aren't doing well, you know, people start getting considered for cuts, like, pretty quick in some teams. Um, less so in the academy teams and like some of the higher two teams because you know success makes everyone happy but I know like some of the teams that did come out of the open division like have some pretty cutthroat stuff going on Um, and like that is the closest thing we have to it is like the like third tier league that Blizzard like kind of puts on but like lets someone else do the broadcast for the open division that's the only thing that has a promotion system you can get promoted from the open division up to contenders and that's like the closest you get basically is you and your friends can play in this you know um in the open division you can sign up and just anyone can play and if you're in the top four then you get a chance to play the bottom four contenders teams and then you get in but then you realize there's not very much money um because i think like last season i can actually check um because like last season some of the bottom teams made like um for the for so for a five-week season right these teams took home like eight grand to like seven grand for six players. Mm. How much yeah. do you get for first? First place is 30,000. Um, so to be, earn like playoffs money, you have to make the playoffs, obviously. And then there's map winnings, right? So some of the really bad teams uh, didn't get like any money um, because you still get money for playing a map and losing it. But the, the money for winning a map was almost double. It was 587 versus 330. So if you're like a, a bad team who's trying to get in and get scrims and develop your yourself as a team, um and like you know because you're a bad team nobody's screaming you and you can't develop you can't learn and you lose a bunch of stuff it is not even close to enough money to be as a living right you can't put your guys in a house you can't pay yourselves a decent salary not even close because then you get this salary three times a year right so like a team like you know grizzly esports right they got eighty two hundred dollars last season they might get that three times a year so for the entire year for six players plus staff they have 24 grand yeah how many teams do you think there are in contenders who actually are better than the Shanghai Dragons? A lot of them. Poof, yeah. A lot like, of them. In, 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 in Korea, NA last that's season, one. Well, yeah, in Contenders Korea, there was there were several. But in I NA mean, last season, all of them. In NA, I, I haven't been following um, NA contenders as closely this season for other reasons. But last season, I would have said six teams were better than the Shanghai Dragons. And it would have just been straight up the top six. It would have been XL2, you know, Fusion, um, Envision, Optic, Gladiators, and Toronto. I would have said they were all better. And then NRG before they lost, um, before they lost, um, 
what's the face Damon to the Shanghai Dragons. Funnily enough, they were they were better. Okay. Yeah. How many flex tanks are better than Gagori? Just kidding. Don't commit career suicide. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it if you want, but I'll I'll give the option to just just politely decline that one. Well, um, the the big I one would is put Dackle, money. Right? Uh, is who? Sorry, Daku from oh, the, over in Korea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah, in yeah. NA, obviously. Oh, like, NA. Whenever we talk about this, primarily you mean NA and EU, and if he works in NA, I'm assuming we talk. Like, Korea is unfair, because as I referenced before, the reason why I don't really consider like contenders is because, like, half the teams... That I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll say it right now. I bet at least the top three or four teams in Korea could place well above the last slot in the fucking Overwatch. Mm, mm. You've already seen a bunch of them that look pretty legit. And some of the teams that restocked when they got their players taken by the Overwatch League look half decent, you know. So I don't feel as though, like, I feel like it's unfair to compare them when, if you, like, in this context, sure, some of those players are going to go to the Overwatch League, but we're mainly th- looking at, like, the Western talent because, in theory, that's supposed to be the path to pro. The path to pro isn't be Korean and just be the best when everyone <laughs> else has gotten. I hope. Well, uh, <coughs> would we care if that was the case? I personally wouldn't, but it, like again, this is the problem. Like, first of all, there has to be a talent development like path. There does have to be something like mm. that, like a way that if you're good, sure. if you, you show it off. And then also, hopefully, this is something that people don't bring up, but maybe we can spin this as a topic. I would hope that as well as this is a way to find good talent who then do go to the Overwatch League, that it can be a legit second league. That, for example, here's a great example. Okay, say an Overwatch League team has a player who they're just never going to play, then he has an opportunity to go play there. Or even better, someone who just gets kicked out of the Overwatch League. But you know what? They want to prove themselves in their career again. I would hope they wouldn't just quit the game and say, well, that's the end of Overwatch for me. Instead, I would hope they'd go play in a contender's team, prove they're good enough. You know, like I realize some of the stuff might be further down the line because you've got to have a few mm. seasons to get it to Sunday. But I'd hope that that keeps it vibrant. Because I have to say, in other games, one of the things that used to depress me a lot about League of Legends is if you knew how many fantastic League of Legends pros in Europe quit because either they didn't have an LCS spot or like... It it just went badly for a little period of time and they were like right well it's gonna to be too much of a grind to get back again so fuck it i just retire like there would have been so much more talent if there had been like a proper structure of like this league a second league ideally yeah third or fourth you know you'd go all the way down like in a, in a dream scenario where you had the full infrastructure sure and some of it is happening right with those uh contract clauses now where overwatch league players can actually drop down to um contenders for I believe like a week. Yeah, a maximum of two yeah. games, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's you can. I'm pretty sure the wording was all. Uh, the only wording was you can designate two players on the Overwatch League team who can like flex to the contenders team. And all it was is that they can't play in a contenders match and an owl match yes. in the same week. Which is a good rule because obviously it's yes. designed so that you can't yeah, just yeah, put yeah. Your, content, your Overwatch League team and then smash everyone in contenders. Yeah, and go you can't just like drop yeah. profit and burdering into like <laughs> a team and just like let them have fun, you know. Fissure could have played for LA Gladiators. I don't know, man. Maker's pretty good too. <laughs> it's not Fisher, but Panker, <laughs> Panker's pretty good. But yeah. but um, but Thorin, some of the stuff that you said actually is already happening. Um, okay. Like the Spitfire players who who got dropped in the middle of the season are a couple of them are like on XL two. Um, I don't remember where all of them were, but I know like the the tanks went to XL two. The thing is that why this is basically happening is because it's practically impossible that these players won't be uh, in the next season of Overwatch League simply because yeah. of the expansion slots and just the requirements to have more players and i mean the the 12th player roster dream is probably still not dead so depending on what teams decide they want to do in uh, or the overwatch league teams we could see a huge demand of uh, just pros all around and that might actually suck a lot of talent out of contenders come overwatch yeah leagues. i, I will yeah. say actually speaking of finding a ray of sunshine in all of the contenders mess is I know there was actually a lot of hope for contenders players because, um, you know, with the with the expansions that are I don't remember if they were confirmed or not actually, but like there were so many rumors about the four extra teams, which is like in theory forty eight potential slots for players, mm-hmm. and then there's a lot of like kind of you know whispers of owl players who are on the bench right now who are probably not going to keep their spots just because like yeah. the teams have decided they don't add value to the to the team you know like just sitting on sitting them on the bench. So in theory, that opens up like a lot more slots on already existing Owl teams. 
So I know, I know in NA at least, there was a lot of like hope from people who, you know, going in because at the end of season one, which later on in the show, we sh if you guys want to talk about um, Poland, I am happy to talk about the event in Poland and like the mess that that was. Um, but <laughs> after Poland, um, hearing some of that stuff was was like kind of a. It was, it was like a lot. I know a lot of people were motivated by kind of the chance, you know, that they can actually make it to Owl. Yeah. Because one thing actually that I was going to mention earlier, but actually the patch thing, I guess, is what invalidates it. Right. Every time on Oversight we ever talk about the roster size, because Monty comes from the world of Korean League of Legends, and you have to understand, up until 2015, Korean League of Legends allowed you to have two different squads compete in the top league in OGN Champions. This is all for the, the audience, but I know some of you guys know this. So the whole point is, one of the reasons, actually, why Korea was so advanced was indeed that not only, you know, did they have fantastic players with great work ethics, but they really could run internal scrims within an org. And infamously, there were some teams that were so good at doing it that you know, they could essentially get practice without ever having to leak any of the practice to the rest of the community until they played the match. So it could be a massive competitive advantage, and especially over Western teams where LCS for a few seasons was around without this being allowed. You weren't allowed to do that if you were CLG or TSM or whatever. Well, one of the things is, yes, that eventually did get taken away in League of Legends. And so Monty thought, this is why every team should have 12 players. You should have 12 players so you can do internal scrims. Now, the flaw I always saw with that is like, if I'm making a team, if we're being honest, I'm probably not going to have subs that are as good as my main players. I'm probably building subs to be subs. So, you know, other options for players or players who aren't quite good enough, but then, you know, let's see if they can earn a spot. I'm probably not going to design my team like, right, I'm going to have, I'm not in fucking Noah, like two of everything, two hmm. of you, two of you. So unless you've got the right roles, obviously it already is going to be inferior practice if you're like your fucking DPS player and flex DPS has to play a tank for a game, you know, it's not going to be ideal. Hmm. So I, to me, the logical solution should have always been just have the academy team and have them do that practice against your main team. And then not only can you potentially see if any of them are good in the actual practice, but also you get real practice that's still hidden. But I guess that makes no sense if you have to play on a different patch because you're not practicing for the Overwatch League anymore. Yeah. Um. So before, like the whole academy team system was announced, I was of the opinion that you should have a total man roster for that exact reason. That you have literally just two of everything, and you can run like internal scrims. And sure, your like B team might not be as good, but at least you can be like, all right, guys, these are the six years you're playing. This is where you're going to stand because we know this team does it right. And this is where you're going to defend from, and we're going to attack, and we're going to like try and we're going to run this a few times so we can dissect it later, right? Um, I thought that made a lot of sense. Um, and then now that the academy team stuff is up, I agree that I think that's exactly what you should use your academy team for, is essentially a team to run stuff by. And if you are... Because I came from the mindset of, you know, we were on Envision and we were not affiliated with an OWL team. So we did it because we got practice playing against like higher skill players and we got to learn a lot from them, you know, because we could record our own VODs and then watch them back and learn from what they're doing, which was definitely helpful. But we did it with the mindset of, you know, we're not like, sh like we're kind of showing them that we're also a good team and like it might be in like the back of their heads. But if you're an academy team, I think if you're in a player on an academy team, it makes sense to take that sacrifice and sacrifice, you know, maybe two hours of practice a week to do that, to then show the coaches of the org that you're directly affiliated with, like, hey, look, you know, I'm a good player, you know, despite the fact that I'm playing on a different patch, I can look good in these scrims, I can, you know, get kills, I can make good decisions. Um, because the academy teams can pick players up from their own team, in theory, for free. Because the buyout money that you have to do goes to the org, but they're the same org. So the money like doesn't go anywhere. So I think it, these teams that you know have, um, you know, if you have a you know an, an all Korean team and you have a team with a bunch of Western players on it, an academy team with Western players that is, I don't think it makes any sense. I think you should have a Korean academy team because then you're potentially farming players yes. that you can just promote. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. another thing. I even said this before Overwatch League started in, in that video that I did, which was about like the Korean issue of like, you know, like one of my pro propositions I gave was mm -hmm. the downside of the Overwatch League is, yes, you're going to sign all the best Koreans you can when it starts. But in the meantime, a bunch are going to develop who are fucking super sick. And then 
are they in the Overwatch League? If they're not, it looks silly. If they are, well, someone's going to sign them. That's one thing I'm amazed more people didn't do. Like, if I was NYXL, if I was London Spitfire, I would absolutely also have a team in Korea. And I, like you say, it would be a farm team. I'd be trying to get the best players onto that team and either be a fucking gangster and sell them to the other teams, so you're literally profiting from them, or... That's my, like, my joke was it's like the Underground Railroad where you get people from Korea into your Overwatch League team. So I actually don't know if there was an explicit rule about this because I, I can't ever remember reading it, but every single Academy team ended up in the same region as the team mm -hmm. is in theory from, right? Like the London Spitfires Academy team is in Europe. Um, yeah. You know, and all the, all of the, you know, um, you know, NA teams are in NA and the Shanghai Dragons one is in China. I, I don't know if they're allowed to own an academy team in a region that they're not technically affiliated with. They they might be, and just nobody did it. Which in which case, I don't know. They're they're probably wasting their time. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually don't know. Yeah, it's also for instance, London Spitfire. I mean, from the outside, it appears to be that they also use the uh, the contenders team to sort of appeal to the British crowd. Yeah. And yes. Why they. But they still did pretty well. Obviously, won that show match against Fusion as well, as well as their contenders the portion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can't overrate that one show match, but still, at the same time, I mean, they were definitely one of the best uh, contenders teams out of the uh, the Western regions, I would say. Um, but yeah, they they there definitely was an emphasis on British players, if I had to guess, because. If I'm thinking, I think if I have the resources of Spitfire, I could have probably created a team, or at least the, the additions they had, that were probably better than the British ones they had. Though in the end, they turned out to be pretty sweet, and yeah. they de developed quite well. But yeah, if, you're, if you have a second objective to fulfill as a contenders team, and obviously then if you're in Europe, you're probably not screaming Koreans in Los Angeles. So, yeah, I mean, the same would probably be also true if that is a region lock thing that, for instance, Seoul would have to get uh, a Korean okay. team there. So yeah. this raises an obvious question, though, which no one seems to address, which is being as this is Overwatch League season one, and it's really just everyone goes to LA for three months and plays there. What the fuck is the path to pro for someone in EU contenders who essentially cannot scrim people who are in LA because you'd have like 150 ping or more. So aren't those guys kind of like stuck in no man's land at the moment? I think they, because in, in NA there's, there's West, Central and East servers. So I'm pretty sure they compromise and play on East if they do. Because okay. I know um, like on Envision, we trialed uh, EU players. And when we did that, because they were living in Europe at the time, you know, we would generally agree with teams that we'd like compromise and play on the East server. And it's like really stupid the way that you have to do it in the client where you're not actually allowed to like select the server. You can select Americas or Europe, right? But it, once you're in the client, you have to be like, okay, well, we have like eight people on West Coast and like eight people in Europe and like, you know, four people on the East Coast server. So we have to like kick all the people on West out, kick all the people in Europe out of the lobby, start the match. And then all the people who are in East, well, then it'll default to the East server, and then you invite everyone back in. <laughs> okay. And nice. then, and then, because of the way that like scrims go, sometimes if a team doesn't finish the map when they attack, you reset the map so the other team has a chance to play through the whole map, right? So when you reset the map, you got to do it all again. So you nice. end up with these scrims where instead of playing six maps, you play like four maps because you have to constantly be kicking people and like reinviting. And if you know some you know pro player gets up and goes to the bathroom during that, he might be gone for three minutes, and it just like adds time. And it's that's a that's the other side thing, um, but I do think they compromise servers. But still, I think it's like eighty ping, and that in no way does that incentivize teams in LA to play, you know, to play um, European teams because they can play on two ping on LAN. Yeah, in a sense, what what is interesting though is that Spitfire was still able to raise their level that way because I'm pretty sure they were only ever able then to scrim other contenders EU teams. Hurricanes. Oh, the Hurricane. Oh, Hurricane, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, not Spitfire. Yeah. Hurricane, as, yeah, as far as I know, that's pretty much all they scrimmed was EU teams. Um, talking to them while we were in Poland, though, because um, a couple of the NA teams, their org flew them over to do a boot camp in Europe, so they were yes. able to scrim those teams as well. Um, but besides that, yeah, I'm pretty sure they only ever scrimmed European teams. And it's part of the reason why, in especially in contenders, such heavy regional metas developed, right? Yeah. Um, that in OWL, because everyone's in the same building playing the games, you know, there isn't really a regional meta. 
Yeah. I mean, there was some rumors that at least the NA Academy teams were sort of trying to get everyone into one location where then they would be able to scrim possibly. I mean, they probably could have maybe negotiated a land client or whatever, but that they would all move to, you know, one state or one city, then have, yeah, the, basically almost like a talent agency there. And then... yeah developed that way right mm, as far as i know that that definitely never i mean it definitely never took off i know mm -hmm. that um because toronto was actually in toronto i don't know if gla had a house actually um optic which is a field associated with houston was was in texas as well we didn't have a house on envision fusion had a house i actually don't know where it was xl2 did have a house in la though um which put them close to the owl mm. team which was probably part of it and then i think energy's house was also in la and then all of the other teams, I don't believe, had a house. Hmm. They're also pretty legit that in the first season, though, there's challenger teams already in the houses and with like proper yeah. environment. Because to be fair, it took like League of Legends took a long time to get to that point, you know. Yeah. And it to be fair, it was almost exclusively Academy teams, which are affiliated with these orgs sure. that have much more money than League of Legends teams had, you know. Yeah. Because some of the I don't know anything about the other regions, but I know in NA, a lot of not maybe not a lot of, but a few teams were being paid basically the equivalent of owl minimum salary. They were being paid like four k a month, which ends up being forty eight a year. So you're like two k beneath owl minimum and plus housing, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, I mean, it's not bad pay for sure. Yeah. And for some of them, that even included the team house, right? Yeah. No. no yeah. It'd be like four k plus a house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think then of the way that contenders did play out? Like, first of all, there's this thing going on where like less teams in EU are going to make it to the land finals. So obviously there's like less opportunity to show off at the, at the moment when everyone might tune in. Obviously, as you referenced earlier, there's been the execution has not been flawless on contenders. So what, what, what are the issues there? What, what can be easily fixed? What are the big problems? Well, I know this season, because at least last season, um, like, you know, obviously the contenders teams knew about the venue before the public did, right? Because they started booking everyone's travel information and stuff. Um, and I don't know if you guys actually saw pictures of the venue, but like the aerial mm. pictures of the Alvernia planet looked amazing. And like yeah. pulling up to the venue, it it seriously looked like you were pulling up to like a, like a moon station on like on moon or on the Mars, right? Like these big domes, these glass tubes, like the venue was looks really cool. Um, and, you know, we were like, oh, well, we're going to get to travel, you know, like maybe we're not going to like Korea or, you know, something, but, you know, we're going to Poland, at least we all get a flight, you know, it, it kind of felt special almost, you know, um, and then, and, you know, we got our own venue, it was just contenders teams there. Yeah, we had to share it, you know, it was Europe and NA there, but, you know, it, it was fine because there's more teams to scrim. Um, and then now, uh, did they announce the venues for playoffs this season? I know what they are, I'm but I don't sure. know if they actually announced them. I'm not sure. I just okay. know that they limited now the slots for EU to two, which obviously co caused quite an outrage. I th oh, isn't it? Wait, do I misremember this? That the the venues are now part of the uh, World Cup as well? Okay, yeah. So I think, yeah, yeah it must have been announced then because, yeah, because Europe, they're only sending two teams, which really sucks. I mean, especially since it's within Europe, you can afford to fly more teams. Um, they're flying two teams to the World Cup stage in Paris, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. And in for NA, they're putting them um, in Burbank at the Owl Stadium, where um, the uh, the World Cup stop is going to be as well. So it's like you don't even get your own venue, you know, like you're sharing it with these teams. Mm -hmm. And for Europe in particular, it's really shitty because some of the out some of the World Cup teams that are going to be you know playing the World Cup have players who might be then playing in contenders. So you're there representing two teams. And yeah. in NA, it's possible as well. You know, actually, no, actually, never mind. There was only a couple contenders players. I don't think they made the final seven. So never mind, actually. But in Europe, at least. Yeah. That's a, that's a huge logistic problem. I hope they scheduled it correctly. But at the same time, that's sort of further for me i hope that would devalue the uh, the world cup because the, t the player then decides to definitely scrim for contenders yeah because contenders are worth a lot more in like the public image you know like they, well, they want to have a title you know yeah i mean 
I'm not sure if Contender is actually worth more than than the Overwatch World Cup for some mad reason, where yeah, you just actually. randomly on random, you know, like lines on the on a map determine who plays with who, and then also yeah. you don't actually pick the best players of your country because there's some weird politics and stuff. Like, and, and then that's actually sad that you're right. <laughs> Yeah, I can, Overwatch World Cup might actually have, and because certainly if you make it to BlizzCon, more people are going to watch you play on that BlizzCon stage. They're going to watch you play in the Contender yeah, Final. Yeah, yeah. Which is weird in itself because if you think about it, like essentially that's the equivalent of the All Star Game for Overwatch is the Overwatch World Cup. You know, I, think, yeah. I mean, obviously they have got an All Star Game as well, but you know, like that's that's what it's been used for in the past to highlight talent in that way. So you would think that wouldn't be about like prize money and that you know it's supposed to be like national pride and yeah. show off for the fans. And yeah, as you say, you can actually be an incredible player and not even get picked. Yeah, because some guy had an argument with you two years ago and you won't say sorry. I mean, if you think about it, just just the payment. <laughs> how players are paid could not be diametrically opposed more on the one hand you have literally maps and go getting into players giving you more money and on the other hand you have like everyone that attends gets the same it's just like yeah. which which competition are you taking more seriously yeah so the really world because cup of patriotism Pfft. yeah so the world cup actually i i just looked the world cup prize pool this year including all the group stage events and everything is four hundred eighty-eight thousand. And uh, this season of contenders, the total prize pool for each region is one hundred eighty-five thousand. Yeah, but prize pool. What, what you said though is a, definitely a, a comforting thought. Though that actually people do play as though it was like a proper league, and they play as though they're in a proper team, and they actually try, you know, to make. Because that's the one thing I worried about as well. When I saw some of the teams, which obviously were put together like pretty ramshackle, because it was people who you know thought they were going to make an Overwatch League team or tried out and then didn't. So like you know, it's like their second option. They wouldn't have chosen to be there. I was really worried that you'd get a lot of like mad egos of players who were like, right, fuck everyone in the team. It's just about me looking good to try and make it. And, you know, that's that was a worrying thought. Like, it's not going to be a legit actual competition. Yeah, it, it turned out to be because I think a lot of people realize that if they're not in the Overwatch League, you know, they might as well can be competing in what is at least billed as the B League, right? Because that's the best way to look good in theory. Um, because it's not like there's, you know, third party tournaments going on that they could play in instead. Um, you know, there's a couple, like, there was the Beat Invitational and like the Pit, um, the Pit tournament. I forget what it was actually called, but like Pit. And those were like super small prize pools. And funnily enough, they got pretty similar viewership to contenders. What um, about, um, I mean, one area I figure that has to be half decent in terms of getting people in the Overwatch League is, does being a coach of a contenders or an academy team, actually, do you think that gives people a chance to become an Overwatch League coach? Because obviously, as we saw in season one, people are absolutely willing to take on new coaches. And even obviously we've learned you have to expand your coaching staff. It's probably not just going to be one guy. Yeah, well, obviously the the easy example that everyone knows is Arrow, um, now head coach of Dallas Fuel. He came from Fusion University, um, and I think you have to do an exceptional job to get noticed in anything in contenders. Anything, coach, analyst, you know, player. You have to be like above and beyond. You have to be very clearly more qualified than people in Overwatch League to get noticed at all. And Arrow was. Um, that like the the roster that ended up winning, he wasn't with them um, for the la for the end of playoffs. To be fair, um, he was already with the field at that point. But that roster, like pound for pound, like the players on paper going into the season, or I'm not even going into the season, but going into like pit when we fir when Envision first played them, we we like dismissed them because it was these players who like had almost no um, like past history or like credibility to their names, right? And there were players who were known. Um, you know, they were known players, mm -hmm. right? But there were players that for a reason we didn't trial, I think literally any of them. Um, we would have trialed like alarm and who are you and stuff if we could, yeah, but, course. um, but you know, we didn't have a team house. So we're like, what are we going to do with these players, you know, from Korea? Um, but like an arrow went in there and he very obviously did some insane things because I remember scrimming them originally when they like first kind of got that roster together and then we didn't scrim them and then we played them in pit. And we got fucking stomped and it was not it was it was not even funny and so i think like you have to be like that kind of person in contenders to stand out where you come in and you like completely 180 this roster like almost single-handedly it's it felt like um I, to be fair after like getting to meet elk and stuff in poland he he it seems like he had kind of a bit to do with that he's got a good head on him um 
And then, you know, Arrow went on to Dallas Fuel, and it sure looks like he's doing good stuff there, too. But mm-hmm. besides that, I don't know what being a contender's coach is really worth at this point. You know, I mean, you know, certainly nobody like reached out to me, you know, after being on Envision. You know, I, I, all the only other teams that reached out to me were contenders team because that's kind of just the level we're at. Nobody from Owl is like, it doesn't feel like anybody in Owl is very seriously watching contenders. Okay. Right. When, you, when the matches would be going on in contenders, were people actually like, because obviously you're playing online as well and you have that whole element, which is going to make people mechanically not look as sick in certain scenarios. Did players still... Were they able to make a proper name for themselves? Like, for example, if the XL Academy played, did Flower or Nano Hanna, as he's gone back to now, did he actually like pop off and look super sick? And, you know, did it live up in that sense to being able to be a platform where people could shine? Funnily enough, I think uh, Flower or Nano Hanna, whatever, he actually looked like way worse than his reputation like yeah. says in, the, in that season contenders because we actually played XL2 in the quarterfinals and uh, we beat them three to two, and every single map that Fla- and the two maps that Flower played, they lost. And it was and like you know, it's kind of a coincidence, right? But he legitimately did not look good. And when they put in um, Nene instead, they they were much more impressive. They were you know a lot harder to deal with. Um, but in terms of like players standing out on like individual like mechanical plays, I really don't think any. I mean. <sighs> I'm sure I know people like some people in Korea maybe stood out a little bit more, um, sure. mm. but but in NA specifically, I can't really think of any. And as awful as it is, you know, there were no clips of there were not that many clips of Overwatch contenders on Reddit on the sure. front page of the yeah. um, of the r slash competitive Overwatch. Right, you see tons of owl clips, tons and tons and tons of owl clips. But I think maybe maybe seriously like five times over the whole season there was a clip of from contenders. Yeah. Because that is a concern that I actually had as well, is that one of the things I've found to be a downside about Overwatch is, first of all, the fact that you can't watch all the POVs or pick the POV you're watching means that you're already living on the grace of whoever the fuck the observer is and what he shows. Yeah. So certain roles obviously don't even get much actual camera time. So that guy already good luck showing everyone you're really good. And then beyond specific types of DPS, like obviously if you're like a tracer player, there's some roles where if your team is just that much worse, you can't really look good. Like that's actually where, for me, I actually categorize Overwatch as more towards the MOBA than the FPS side. Because the great thing about Counter-Strike is you can be on the worst team in the world. If you really are like Kenny S or something, you could just go off every game. You know, you could still show that like, hey, at least I'm a beast. Yeah. That might just never translate, I feel like. So it, it, unless, as you say, you know, expansion slots open and entire teams get scooped up who are really good, it is worrying that you could get players in specific roles. Like I'm thinking of players who play like the diva player or something. I could see these sorts of players just getting lost in the mix. Like who really knows how good that guy is? Yeah. And that's one of those things where <sighs> that's one of those things where if the owl teams were actually talking to their Academy teams, they would have a really good impression. I think of where people's okay. skill level is right. Because, you know, I, uh, especially among the top teams who, you know, the top teams for obvious reasons, try to scrim each other, right. They don't really, Yes. You know, try and scrim like the the bottom teams. You end up playing, you know, maybe the same team a bunch, right? And sure, you're not listening to that player's comms, but like, you know, if I'm sitting there watching overhead view of this player play still for like, you know, six, eight, ten hours a week, I still have a pretty darn good idea of what he's like as a player. Um, and like, I, you know, I think so. In that instance, it's a lot easier for the players and the staff within the league to evaluate the other players in the league. Obviously, you know, I get more a lot more um, footage in, than, you know, the public does. And I get to choose my angle of footage, you know, during scrims and stuff. So if they're talking to people, I think they'd get a good idea of who to invite to a uh, trial for, you know, different teams, right? And I think I think a solid example of that is legitimately um, McGravy um, from Envision, now Team Envy, got invited to the U.S. World Cup team. And, you know, there were, you know, American-born, you know, flex tank players on um, you know, higher on teams that did better in the first season contenders even, but also in OWL, right? And he got invited over them to trial. He didn't make the final seven, but at least he got to make that 12 or 16 or 12. Yeah, whatever it was. And, you know, he got to look really good because of it. You know, he got he got to have his name up there with all these other famous players, right? And like, that's a big deal for him. Um, and the same for Crimzo, I know, made Team Canada. and He made the final seven. Like, that's a big deal. And unfortunately, people might know them better for that than contenders. 
It's also, I think we can't um, underrate how important uh, World Cup was for team selections, uh, like as, as exhibitions in general, because someone like an EQO, you're not watching tier three Overwatch. He was in some Israeli team that didn't even really get to the last, last eight in like uh, go for Overwatch tournaments or whatever. And then he he was uh, on the Israeli roster, obviously. And that's also one thing I think talent scouting is hard in Overwatch. I also think a lot of teams have mediocre talent scouts. And when you can then ask your players that know these people from ladder and just, okay, at least have an idea how they are mechanically and how they get outplayed, for instance. Like, I, I had tons of people, for instance, telling me that KSF was pretty sick on, on ladder and that maybe if you're telling that your um your you know well, whoever is in charge of signing these players well that certainly helps right it, even if you yeah. don't have that that data from you know the, all these contenders uh, matches and keep yeah. in mind we, we're not even getting stats on these guys so yeah and if i remember right actually winston's lab wasn't even doing stats so i didn't even have that to like work with like yeah. i was for for envision like i would literally if like a player asked for stats I would like record a POV bot of that player for a two hour block and then watch it back and just literally make tally marks on a Google Doc, right? And then count them later to like give them stats on X, Y, and Z, right? We just don't but, like, have the technology. That's what yet. we had to do. Huh? We just don't have the technology yet. Yeah, we just don't have the technology for an API, you know? Um, <laughs> Obviously, it was, uh, there was a bug recently in the Overwatch League app where it showcased pretty much exactly the stats you... It's the way they were like, sorry, it. that was accidental. We've removed that now. Oh, well. Oh, yeah. Was then, yeah. Yeah, well, wasn't ready for release, whatever. Ned Nenza came out and said that, yeah. Oh, I actually didn't even notice that. I have the app. I never use it. Yeah. I mean... Maybe I should have. For Winston's lab, it was basically... You know, you have to always... It's not worth the web that. traffic, I'm sure. Uh, web traffic, it's also... I mean, if if someone had a vested interest, if some journalist is researching stuff, then he might be able to put that in. Actually, like if you're watching this and you want to want to have these stats up, you can probably apply to Winston's lab and help out out with that because there's a lot of manual labor to be done there. But yeah, in general, I think uh, this is this is a, a big like wall to climb that we don't have stats so you can at least yeah. see these anomalies of these players right? yeah so actually that that reminded me of what my point was was you said that talent scouting in overwatch was really hard and i agree and i think compared to a lot of other games i think that like the amount of i don't know it's not it's not actually data but like the amount of time you have to spend like watching that player is higher than other games in my opinion um yes. And it gets even harder because tournament, like we said, tournament VODs aren't necessarily their POV, right? They might not be on camera, but they might still be doing really important things, right? Yes. Um, or, you know, most teams, when they record scrims, they have somebody record, again, overhead VODs because it gives you the best overall picture of what happened, right? So, you know, 90% of the time, you can dissect what happened from an overall view if you have all 12 players on camera, right? Like most of the time. But even then, you're not getting direct information of what that player exactly sees and exactly what they're doing, right? So unless that player is recording every single scrim they play in and uploading every single scrim they play in, you know, with their comms, with their team comms, you know, so you can really see how that player works, and then they send it off, and then the OWL team watches through 10, 15 hours of that, that's the only way you're ever going to know without just asking people for the shortcut. And, like, talent scouting is going to be incredibly hard in Overwatch for that alone. It's just, it's just going to be until we have the technology. Yeah. It's so wild that some of the tech in esports doesn't exist. Like, I'll give you an example. Okay, one thing I, I actually, as a pithy way to make this point. So in Counter-Strike, for example, a game where because you don't generally tweak the weapons much, the problem the game has, like I obviously love this aspect, is it's the same every time. And it's the same for years at a stretch, you know. Yes. So one of the, the problems the game has is it doesn't have much of an influx of new maps. And yet for us, maps in Counter-Strike should be the variable that keeps interesting as, you know, heroes and champions are in League of Legends and Dota, that characters are in, in Overwatch. That should be the way that you mix it up, right? Well, I, I once made the point that if you can't, well, since CSGO got big, which is like about three years ago, and if you looked actually, Valve, say the, 
amount of rev that they make each year. And they were making like over 200 mil rev each year that it got really massive. So I made the point that like, if the game's made the better part of a billion dollars revenue and they still haven't invested in like, you know, a team of people who work on maps or a committee who source the best maps, it just tells you there's almost nothing will make. I mean, my joke was, do we need 2 billion to be made mm. before? You know, like where's the fucking threshold at which point you'll just invest in that tech? Likewise, they can tell me all day long, we've had 500 million in buy-ins. It's like, well, okay, how many trillion do I need to get before I can have API with all the stats, a fucking client where I watch the POVs? Like, you know, what do I need to get this tech from you guys? It seems yeah. like a mystery at this point in time. That's why I actually am skeptical, because here's the thing. I mean, Albion, you come from leagues, so you know this. Riot kept doing the whole soon TM on the replays. And they didn't bring replays out, I think, until last year. I think it was something... Was it actually that late? I, I think it was like season seven or season eight before we got replays in League of Legends. Oh, so like, fuck. And even then, I'm not sure it like works like the traditional style of, you know, you just record one and release. Like, so think of that. If, if they can delay it that long, I don't know what's going to happen for Overwatch because, you know, what, like it's the sort of thing where I feel like they'd at least be telling the teams if they had it on the horizon. You're like, oh, don't worry, in a few months or for season two... So it feels to me like they might just never never release some of that stuff because I don't know what the holdup is. What's the delay? It's also... It seemingly enhances every aspect of your game. Yep. Yeah. And it's also for staff or analysts. It's like if you want to analyze an Overwatch League game, that literally might take you three times as much time as the analyst on an Overwatch League team that can just has access to the top down view or top down yeah. map. Yeah, by the way, people were actually having to do the same thing you described before. That's how in League we got all the stats. The people who did those wikis used to just yeah, 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 yeah. watch the VOD and pick out every single <laughs> like fucking kill and assist. Like, what a nightmare yeah. that is. Like, I don't, God bless whoever did that, but like, that's also a disgrace. In terms yeah, of well, and, and it's because it's, like kills and assists are like relatively easy to yes. do right but if you're like trying to because i did this multiple times for mcgravy like if i'm trying to tell my diva player how many times he is using defense matrix okay. like that is an incredibly time consuming task right and i have to go like this is how many times you're mm -hmm. using it like on average per fight this is what you're blocking with it right and i have to go through and like record all these things so every time he pressed right click i would seriously have to make like four check marks you know, and <laughs> then, you know, and then my head coach would ask me or not my head, but like the assistant coach would ask me like, hey, this block, I need you to every single time he presses shift, record who he's pressing shift at. And then I go, OK, well, that's yes. what I'm recording now, you know, and, Just and data it, slip. <laughs> yeah. that's that's kind of what I was on Envision. You know, I, I ended up doing a lot of data. I mean, I did other stuff as well, but that's what you have to do. You have to have somebody who ultimately yes. it's not hard work. Anybody could do this stuff as long as you like vaguely know what the game Overwatch is. But it's just time consuming. Yeah. I literally had like the idea for Winston Slap to have, you know, you know what captures basically do. It's like you, they basically, Google or whatever company basically takes a picture of a page of a book and then has like 50 people read that sp same uh, word. And then just by p having people answer this question, Google then realize what that word is and whatever, you know, cursive that is. Just do that for some very, you know, very high traffic internet instead of, you know, ad advertisement or whatever, like something like this, because the data entry is like wizard chunk slaves. That's pretty good, actually. So there'd be a capture when I go to a page, right, to like log into the Overwatch League. And, it, and instead of saying, you know, like, which of the squares is the signpost in? Instead, it just says like, you know, how many times did you choose the defense matrix in the light in this 30 second <laughs> clip? And yeah. it turns out I'm actually like a, an outsourced data slave creating all this content. Yeah, you're right. Wizard, Wizard Young should basically just make like a screensaver or something where he sort of gives you tips on Overwatch. But what he doesn't tell you is it uses all your computer cycles to like generate the fucking AI neural network that he <laughs> needs that, to run all of his. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that that's where, where legitimately, if you want to start working in Overwatch with an OWL team or even a contenders team, learn how to program. Like, that's something that I, I've, like, actually started doing is, like, just there's, like, websites that, you know, for free or for very little cost will start teaching you how to program. Because I know, like, when the Philadelphia Fusion earlier this year put out an ad saying they need an analyst, you had to, learn like, know I forget what languages it was. We had to know a couple programming languages because like their analyst, the guy BZ does like some awesome stuff with data yes. and he does it all through coding. Okay. Right? And like, because Blizzard hasn't done it. So we have to do it. Yeah.
See, yeah, this is I, where Wizard Hyong should just go and like actually like make a deal and hire like the population of an entire Indian village to just what because they wouldn't need like a high level computer to watch the clips. Just watch the clips and just generate all this data for me. <laughs> I, I'm pretty, pretty sure beast, I can't lie. some of that is actually happening. Even though I've heard there's there's possibly you know some gray area tools that can read stuff like oh, that, yeah. but. I, the, he there there leaked a document that was supposedly Wizard Young's, and I totally I think what they did was in in a video of NYXL he had like a URL visual uh, visible, and someone wow. typed that in, and that was somehow not protected. And then they saw that the, he evaluated how a Widowmaker shot, like after how many frames and whatever. And this is like. Either you have the sickest data slaves, you're hella trolling us, or you have some tool that, that does, does that sound thing. like some sort of god tier troll, though, doesn't it? Just like because yeah. he wants to make he wants the mystique to grow, doesn't he? And everyone, every other because what he basically wants, okay, it reminds me of a great story where the the really famous comic book writer Alan Moore, the guy who wrote Watchmen and stuff, he once wrote a comic that actually didn't all come out because it was like a super ambitious project and it was going to be like you know one where when like they'd come up with a concept of like fractal time or something, he was going to do a comic book that was like that. And so what he did was he mapped out the entire twelve issues on like one massive piece of paper like every frame and every single color and all he said he did that for is he said he didn't actually need that to write the story it was just so that when friends of his who were comic book writers came around they'd just be like what are you working on and they'd show them that and they'd just like shit themselves instantly like my god I'm so far behind <laughs> like, and he was just fucking with them you know like it's actually like what it feels like Wizard Young's doing with all of us with, with all this fucking banter <laughs> yeah yeah do you think there are currently so it was in contenders, to be fair. But do you think that there are talents currently in any in in a scene that could like develop like an EQO who legitimately is one of the best DPS players now in the league, like individual players? Yeah, and be one of the best DPS players in the league. Um, Eventually develop into. Yeah, there are, there are a few. I mean, within NA, like the obvious examples are the um, the two Koreans on Fusion University who are you an alarm. They're both. I think. I, if I, I think, who are you eligible for next season? But Alarm like just turned seventeen, like hmm. yesterday, two days ago. So he won't be eligible till season three. But I mean, pretty much across the board, if you ask players in NA who's the best player in contenders, you're going to get a lot of people saying Alarm. Um, he is kind of. He's not even a baby Jonak. He's just kind of like up there. He's just another Zenyatta player who just frags hard. You know, he just hits way too many shots. Like. Um, and to be fair, maybe, you know, playing online is good for him because he hasn't, you know, really had to like play a steady land circuit yet. Um, but mm -hmm. to be fair, he also didn't do poorly, uh, on, on land in Poland. You know, he still did well there. So that, that's kind of an obvious one in terms of like actual Western players. Um, yeah, there's like, there's like, there's some DPS like, uh, Toronto Esports and like, uh, GGA, uh, former optic has some good players. Um, I'm biased because he was my, they were my former players, but I think like Crimzo and Gravy and Shiny have a lot of potential to make it into Owl. Maybe not be the best players, but definitely make it into Owl and like be big players, you know? Um, mm, trying to think about who else. Oh, obviously like Nene and Nano Hana oh, yeah. on XL2 and like, you know, a lot of the Korean players in Nene are really good. What about this thing? I've, I've got a good final question. It's a dark one, but. <laughs> Since, as as we've referenced, there are many Koreans not just waiting in Overwatch content, Korea who have already on the contenders teams because people are looking at them, thinking about them for Overwatch League, or some of them are just like, obviously you're waiting for them to be the right age. Is Do you actually think in the future that it will be overwhelmingly Koreans that come into the Overwatch League and therefore either contenders has to be even better to actually really develop talent or it might actually become something of a futile thing where like you know a lot of NA players are playing in contenders while Overwatch League teams are like half Korean dystopian ending to the episode yeah <laughs> what, what do you think about that um, is it a concern is there anything people worry about I think the public is more worried about it than the players are because like there was that article that I I, I like skimmed through real briefly and it was like uh, contenders is like becoming too Korean and it's like a problem or something like somebody wrote an article because um, they were complaining that a team in contenders Pacific was a full Korean roster right okay um, and there's you know and then that there was a bunch there's 
I think it's I think it's actually only like three or four teams in NA don't have a, a Korean player on them. There's no full Korean rosters, but they everybody has like one or two pretty much. Um, I think hmm. I don't I I really don't know because I think going into the season the season one of Owl I think uh I, the the it kind of not excuse I don't really know what the word for it would be but like the the line of reasoning I suppose that I heard from a lot of Western players was like well yeah you know like there might be Korean players who on a mechanical level like outskill me and everything but you know because I'm like a native English speaker or something like I might be more marketable or something that was a phrase that like got thrown around a bunch right it was like okay. were the players marketable as well as successful players right because like it's hard to deny like some of the easy examples are on the outlaws right like muma and jake are obviously players sure, that like yeah. have huge fan bases and you know Guguri as well right and outside of in-game performance that's still kind of like a win for the org right to have popular players so i heard that kind of thrown around a lot but players like Guguri actually and players like you know pine and say Biolbi and you know jonak all these players who very clearly have fan bases of their own um, so I don't know. I I don't know if it's a problem if the whole league becomes Korean. I think it might be because viewership might drop because I think there are people who probably want to watch Western players play. And obviously, you know, viewership dropping would be an issue for Owl. But for contenders, I think because of the state that contenders is in right now where it gets like so little attention, marketability is not really a thing right now. It, and that's not a concern. It's basically are you better than this other player? Will you make us a better team? Can we succeed more? If yes, then you know you have a pretty good sh chance of taking the slot, probably. So will it go all Korean? I, I have a lot of respect for the amount of talent that Korea is able to churn out, but I don't think they're able to churn out enough mm -hmm. where they'll actually just like completely take over every region. I think that's kind of absurd, right? To just ask like, oh, you know, we're gonna need you know a couple hundred more players from Korea, like you know, in the next year. I don't think that's gonna happen. Yeah, I think if anything, what we saw in the Overwatch League, with the exception of Philadelphia Fusion, there's actually a high demand for Korean coaches simply because coaching turned out to be so, so important in terms of talent development. And pretty much all the Western players that we think to be equal or very close to the top Korean ones did it under Korean coaches. So if, if Korean coaches, or at least what they represent, could find their way into talent development in contenders, and yes, there's not that many coaches left in, uh, in contenders Korea even, that I could name or say, okay, they have a long tenure in, in esports, other than, for instance, the, the Element Mystic guy, um, Yun, as I think his name. Th there is the limitation there, I think, and if you can then bring those also to the contenders teams or at least comparable coaches with, you know, the, this long history of talent development, maybe also in other sports and actually bring out an EQ or, or raise Linkser up to that level or put Sh Shofor there, even though, okay, Shofor was on Dipay's, I'm not sure, do they actually have a Korean coach, whatever, but like if if you have the quality coaches, I, I think there's no real reason why Western players couldn't just you know fight for their spots and defeat the Korean creep. Right? Yeah, I agree with that because I you know there are plenty of players in in NA who are just as hungry as the Korean players are you know to prove themselves and to make it into Owl because you know this is this is what these guys have kind of decided to do with you know this portion of their lives right. Um, and of course, some are going to be more dedicated than others. That's just how it goes. But there are plenty who are very willing to put in the work. No, let's just leave it on that then. Leave, uh, we actually ended with an optimistic sort of... Well, we can end it on a pessimistic note if we oh, talk about what Blizzard... <laughs> huh? Right, what, 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 what was the other topic you had? Well, there was, there was a couple <laughs> things that I know irked uh, a lot of players and contenders. Well, the first one was that because obviously they don't want to detract from owl viewership contenders was always on days that owl wasn't broadcast right, right. um and multiple times and i believe it was the like pretty significant majority of the time the overwatch league twitch channel which has i don't know but far more followers than the you know overwatch contenders twitch channel would be streaming like the thing where you can do like the rebroadcasts now on twitch so they'd be rebroadcasting old Overwatch matches while Overwatch oh, Contenders was on yes. and not hosting 
Overwatch contenders. So then all the people who follow Overwatch League would see Overwatch contenders, right? Um, so they don't do that. And like the Overwatch League Twitter account has a lot more Twitter followers than the Path to Pro, you know? And I think, mm, I, I don't actually know exactly how many, but it was pretty limited the amount of times that they like, you know, shared anything off of the uh, Path to Pro account. And they certainly didn't promote the Path to Pro account a ton. Um, so I know those bug people because that alone combined with the fact that they don't put like the overwatch league skin tokens onto the contenders broadcast which could incentivize people to just even just open the broadcast right mm. like literally just open it up on a second monitor and just like leave it there because then you get in-game skins right if you just like have it open which still increases viewership and still can lead to you know whatever more attention for these players like those three things just weren't there and it really bugged a lot of contenders players and all of them seem pretty easy to be honest you know it's it's a you know I don't know what I suppose I don't know what it is to integrate the the skin tokens into the stream that was I'm sure a whole thing but just like clicking retweet on the account or like hosting the Twitch channel is really not that hard and mm. it's a super easy way to give like way more attention to these contenders players that they're not getting now yeah. and then there was Poland <laughs> um, I mentioned earlier Poland I didn't go to the contenders like season zero or whatever it was in 2017 right because i wasn't working with the team then but i was there with a with a ton of players who were there and hearing the differences between the venue was pretty shocking like the venue looked really amazing but like the player area was like super hot like we got there the like the shuttles were super limited so we got there like a couple of hours after some of the other teams and when we got there some of the other teams still didn't have working pcs to play scrims on yet so they're just like sitting around at the venue, not being able to play. And it was just like, I won't get too into it because I don't want to get myself in too much trouble. But like, it was pretty clear, it was pretty clear that like the difference between when Contenders was the only tournament, right? And Owl wasn't on and how much like Blizzard was invested in it to now. Mm. And it's just very clear that Contenders is like not a priority to Blizzard. Because I think seriously at that whole event, we like had to fairly regularly ask for like it people and there was one it guy for eight teams and it just like it would take forever to get any issues resolved for your pcs or anything right um and it's just pretty clearly not a priority to them and that really upsets the players you know because it's something they're trying to do with their life and they want to you know believe that you know blizzard is invested in their success because their success if they do well and they bring attention to the league is also blizzard's success and it just feels like there should be some sort of back investment from Blizzard that just isn't there. And because there's no money there, there's just no money in contenders right now. Every single team in contenders that's paying its players, I guarantee you is losing money hand over fist because there's no sorts of, you know, broadcast rights. There's no skin sales, none of that stuff. Right. So it's a system where if you're not an academy team that already has a bunch of money from investors, it's like, why, why, why are you in contenders? And to be fair, like that's pretty much the reasoning that um, Sub, the Envision owner, gave for why he dropped the roster because he's just losing money. And you know, there's there's no way for him to be like, okay, well, but at least if my team does well, there'll be an owl, and then yes. boom, you know, then I can start making money. To him, it just looks like, and to a lot of other people, it just looks like you're going to lose money in contenders. And as long as that's there, like the league will never be a legitimate league because no one will put the effort into making it one. Yeah, whereas actually to contrast with League of Legends, because obviously LCS is somewhat vaguely similar structure, that is actually why a lot more money got pumped into Challenger before they had franchise, which was that you got that, you could potentially get a League of Legends spot. So that could literally, I mean, some people just sold the team if it was the Challenger team of a League of Legends team already for a lot of money because you have the spot, or some people just wanted their org to get in the League of Legends. It was a way to boost yourself to the top level. So you're right, there was a different incentive there that apparently doesn't exist in this regard and probably the most alarming part is it doesn't really exist and it's not like the exposure or the promotion of the league's very good so yeah it's also hard for example if i'm just someone who only has a contenders team how am i actually going to sell off the back of that like how am i going to get yeah. the sponsors on board to and, pay the salary i need to and as someone who like literally wrote sponsor pitches for a th for a non-academy org right during the season believe me it's hard to sell like hey do you want to sponsor this team we play once a week to like you know whatever it was, like eight or 9,000 viewers, right? Like that's not a ton of attention for any brands. So mm -hmm. that's why you don't see any of these like, you know, um, third party like uh, contenders teams ending up with like any sponsors really. Like we managed to get a Jersey sponsor and Gamer Subs and that was it, right? And like Gamer Subs had been with the team for a really long time, I guess. So like the entire time I was there for like six and a half months or whatever, we got one additional sponsor 
who, as far as I know, literally just like gave us the jerseys that we played in in Poland. It's also, you can't even make re really money by developing talent. At least previously, I'm not sure if it's now break even point, but it used to be that the the buyout fee was, I believe, 25% of the eventual salary that the player would earn at the Overwatch League team, yeah. right? So it's How like, are you making money on this? It's yeah, practically impossible. It was, and like the example, like in the official rules, they give an example of how the formula breaks down, right? And it was like yeah. the 50K minimum plus like a signing bonus. And it was something along the lines of like, the team would make like 13 to 14 grand, right? Off the selling of a player. And in theory, if you have that player, because there's two signings, right? At the end of the year and at the start of the year. Mm. So if you have a player who doesn't get signed at the start of the year and you have him for, you know, eight months to the year, you're going to pay, if, if you're paying him any sort of wage, you're going to pay him more than 12, 13 yes. grand, you know, yes. even if you give him just even two grand, which is not livable in any way, you know, unless you're also providing a house. So these orders are just not going to make money. There's just, there's no money. See, there's an obvious conflict of interest there, which is that that would be all well and good if Blizzard really did believe in the path to pro and they want to grow the game and it was all about the eSport. But if I had to guess their number one priority, it's keeping Overwatch League teams happy. And yes. if I'm an Overwatch League franchise, that's a fucking great system for me. I, the game's pretty much rigged in my favor to get it's the players perfect. I want into my team and then I don't even have to pay that much for it. Like, that's actually kind of nuts because, by the way, it's a contrast to a different esports game. At the moment in CSGO, it's the opposite problem. What's happened is because... Uh, because nowadays it's standard that everyone's signing like two or three year contracts, even at like the semi-pro slash tier three level. Exa a great example would be right now, okay, so in CSGO, one of the best teams last year was the team that is now under the org made in Brazil. They were formerly SK Gaming, the Brazilian team. Now, the reason they have two North American players is not due to a lack of talent in Brazil. It's that even to sign a Brazilian player that someone who only watches tier one hasn't heard of might cost... You know, seventy thousand dollar buyout for that player. So as a result, it's the opposite in that game. Like actually, you can really make your money back selling the player on if you're tier three. And in fact, it incentivizes you to scout out talent, to put them in your team, to try and get them up in the leagues. You know, because then yeah. when you sell them, you're really going to make your bank off them because if they're that good and someone really wants them, you're going to get paid. Yeah, but that's and because in that game, there's no Valve dictating how much the buyout is. I'm sure the orgs allowed to like. Um... There's Whatever. no such thing as poaching rules in, in CSGO, mate. Valve is just the absent parent. Like, basically, it's the Wild West. But I'm, I'm sure, like, it, generally speaking, in the player's contract, like, the org is allowed to um, the like, buyout, negotiate mate. the buyout. Yeah. Uh, well, in, here's the thing. You, you can negotiate it, but again, it's, it's an open system. It's like if you want to sell your lawnmower, yeah, I can offer you less, but you don't have to take it. You yeah, can say yeah, this yeah, lawnmower yeah. costs $1 million, in which case, yeah. I'm sure I'll lock if I offer half a million, right? Yeah, <laughs> but in this case, if you... Like when the player signs a contract, they have to sign a contract that has this clause in it. And if they haven't signed that contract, they can't play in contenders, right? So, right. and there's a clause that literally says, this is exactly how much the yes. OWL team will pay based on the salary. The org that has the player has no say in it. And the player can go over the org's head and sign the paper themselves and say, yeah, I want right. to go so and okay. just leave. It, it, and that's why in contenders, you're allowed to have a different roster every week because there's a potential that you literally play a match the next day you lose two of your players yeah if anything these rules currently encourage the flipping of players very quickly right yeah so and i'll just get get in I, i'm not really developing you know who y'all or who reg i'll just bank on that in a month someone gives me those yeah i, I believe it's 100 percent now isn't it or it gives what I, 100% of the salary or what? what's the new rule that oh, they Oh, I, I actually don't know, but I'm sure it's not 100. I'm sure you don't have to buy out for 50K. Yeah, but but whatever, like the, obviously then they have minimal investment in them. But yeah, help yeah, them. Yeah, you're right. Didn't really develop them at, at all. And they then make money coincidentally, of course, in the Academy team. Yep. This video was kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Gardner Wilson, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Alex Adams, Daniel Yordanov, TTMXMP, Vexi, Hopped, Robert Baxter, and Travis Greb, with a special thanks going out to Jerky's Minion. Want teasers for my upcoming content? To ask a question for my monthly AMA? How about taking part in a discussion with me about esports? Or perhaps you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? 
Become a part of the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.